good day one and all. I am Glidel Arpongaron together with Hans Zaya Tisado, Marimel Fernandez, Madel Bayonla, Yunilin Arobio, Cheska Sweet Armayan, Anna Marie Ebrano, and Mary Joy Orozco. Today, we'll be discussing about Fab Love's classical conditioning, turned likes connectionism, Skinner's operant conditioning, and neo behaviorism. So without further ado, let's get started with our first reporter, Hans Zaya Tisado. So for other phenomenon in classical conditioning is the CR will gradually reduce in strength and defeat according to Wotun and Bodhi in 2004. When the CS is frequently unreinforced, that is, without the UCS. Extension is the term for this phenomenon. The CR may be recovered once the extension of learning occurs over time, according to Rovens in 1990. A spontaneous recovery is a phenomenon that occurs after a species has been wiped off. This means that extension does not entirely entail the parents being alert, according to Riddish et al. in 2020. Despite the fact that classical conditioning entails learning the relationship between two stimuli, these relationships can be complicated. In classical conditioning, a number of factors influence the rate and substance of learning. Among them are whether the CS is followed by a US, how many CSS are present, whether the organism has any prior experience with the CS, the U.S. or the relationship between the two and how much time elapses between the C.S. and the U.S. delivery. Furthermore, the C.S.S. can be complicated as the context itself. Although the responses investigated in classical conditioning laboratory experiments are frequently simple, such as an eye blink, this is simply a control and measurement issue. Classical conditioning can also include sophisticated learned responses, and it is thought to play a significant part in ordinary human behavior. Another feature of Fabian's classical conditioning is generalization in Figure 15. Whether the dog salivates only by hearing the buzzer, it is likely to produce similar CS when it hears a faster or slower beat of the buzzer or any device with a sound that is very similar. However, Harris in 2006 noted that the more unlike the new stimulus is to the CS, the less is the generalization is arises. So for the last part of this lesson, the Watsonian conditioning, John B. Watson, full name of John Brothers Watson, born in January 9, 1878, near Indianville, South Carolina, US, died September 25, 1958, in New York, New York, American psychologist who codified and popularized behaviorism and approach to psychology that, in his opinion, was limited to the objective experimental study of the relationship between environmental events and human behavior. During the 1920s and 1930s, Watsonian behaviorism was dominant psychology in the United States. Watson earned his PhD in psychology from the University of Chicago in 1903 and subsequently went on to teach there. In 1908, he was appointed as a professor of psychology at Johns Hopkins University, where he frequently created a comparative psychology laboratory. In the seminal work, Psychology as a Behaviorist Used It in 1913. He declared that psychology is the science of human behavior which, like animal behavior, should be studied under controlled laboratory settings. In 1914, he released his first book, Behavior, an Introduction to Cooperative Psychology. He made a strong case for the use of animal subjects in psychology research, describing this thing as a set of reflexes triggered by inheritance. He is also pushed for conditioned responses to be used as the best experimental instrument. Watson entered the field of newborn research in 1918, when it was still largely unknown. He conditioned fear of white rats and other hairy items and little Albert. 
an orphan 11-month-old boy in one of his most famous experiments and one of the most controversial in psychology history. Watson's position was definitively stated in another keyword, psychology from the standpoint of a behaviorist in 1919 in which he attempted to apply the concepts and methods of comparative psychology to the study of human beings and adamantly advocated the use of conditioning in research. His time in academic psychology came to a close abruptly. Watson resigned from Johns Hopkins in 1920 following the spectacular headlines surrounding his first wife's divorce. In 1921, he began his career in advertising. For the general reader, Watson's book Behaviorism in 1925 is credited with enticing many people to pursue a career in psychology. Watson focused solely on business until his retirement in 1946 with the publication of Psychological Care of Infant and Child in 1928 and his revision of Behaviorism in 1930. Hello and good day everyone. I am Mermel Fernandez. I am here to discuss to you about Pavlov's classical conditioning. But before that, let us first talk about what is behaviorism. In psychology, behaviorism is concerned with the behavioral changes and the rule of the environment in these changes. And in here, behaviorists believe that nurture plays an important role in gaining knowledge. The main aim of behaviorism, according to John B. Watson, a known behaviorist, is to obtain laws to discuss the connections that occur among antecedent conditions, behavior, and following conditions. The behaviorism philosophy can be divided into two categories, associationism and reinforcement. Now let's go back to Pavlov's classical conditioning. Ivan Pavlov was a physiologist who did Nobel Prize winning on digestion. He spent the rest of his life studying the reflexes of the dogs that made him accidentally discover the classical conditioning or also known as the association theory. Classical conditioning is a type of unintentional learned behavior. It is a type of learning that had a major influence in psychology known as behaviorism. When learning through classical conditioning, an automatic conditioned response is paired with a specific stimulus and this creates a behavior. To further understand this, let us see the experiment of Pavlov. In his experiment, Pavlov uses a dog, meat, and a bell. Before going to his experiment, let us first define some terms that will help us understand the discussion. Stimulus in psychology, is an environmental event that affects the organism. A conditioned stimulus, or UCS, is a stimulus that leads to an automatic, naturally, and unlearned response. A conditioned response, or UCR, is an unlearned response that occurs naturally in reaction to the unconditioned stimulus. And lastly, neutral stimulus, or NS, doesn't trigger any particular response at first, but when used together with an unconditioned stimulus, it can effectively stimulate learning. Now let us keep in mind these terms because this will help us in our discussion. The experiment of Pavlov has three phases. Phase 1 before conditioning, phase 2 during conditioning, and last, phase 3 after conditioning. In phase 1 before conditioning, the meat is being presented to the dog, where the dog immediately responded through salivating. In this situation, the conditioned stimulus, which is the food, triggers the unconditioned response, which is the salivating of the dog. At this moment, no learning has occurred because the dog's salivation, whenever it sees food, is a natural response or reflexes that does not need to be learned. Pavlov continues his experiment in phase 1 by ringing the bell repeatedly in front of the dog. But not like earlier, Pavlov did not get any response from the dog. The reason behind this is because the bell at this point is a neutral stimulus. It does not trigger the dog to response or salivate, not like in food. But in phase 2 during conditioning, the bell or the neutral stimulus is now repeatedly paired with the meat or the conditioned stimulus every time Pavlov feeds the dog. As a product of this pairing, the bell or the neutral stimulus and the meat or the conditioned stimulus create an association. At this moment, the neutral stimulus or the bell is now known as the conditioned stimulus, and now the subject or the dog has been conditioned to respond to this stimulus. The ones called as the neutral stimulus in phase 1 is now known as the conditioned stimulus in phase 2 after pairing it with the conditioned stimulus that earns a conditioned response from the subject. In the last phase of the experiment, which is phase 3 after conditioning, since the association has been made between the food, the conditioned stimulus, and the bell, the conditioned stimulus, presenting the bell alone, 
cat will elicit a response from the dog even the food is not shown. In this last phase, the response of the dog is now learned or conditioned, and we call this the condition response. The condition response is the learned response to the previously neutral stimulus. To recapitulate, classical conditioning entails learning to associate an unconditioned stimulus that already elicits a specific reaction with a new conditioned stimulus in order for the new stimulus to elicit the same response. A new stimulus called a neutral stimulus or NS does not elicit a response. It becomes a conditioned stimulus after the neutral stimulus has become connected with a conditioned stimulus or CS. The response to the conditioned stimuli is known as the conditioned response or CR. Classical conditioning emphasizes the importance of gaining knowledge from one's surroundings and favors nurture over nature. It is also crucial in understanding the behavior of human and animal. However, describing behavior purely in terms of nature or nurture is restrictive, and such attempts undervalue the complexity of human behavior. Good day everyone, I am discussing the lesson 2, Thorndike's Connectionism. Within the first half of the 21st century in the United States, Edward L. Thorndike in 1874 to 1949 was prominent because of his law of learning. Primarily under the umbrella of associationism or connectionism, Mayer 2003. It is mainly concerned with the connection between the stimulus and response, which is SR. According to Caradot 2012, Thorndike is one of the few psychologists who focus on education. In improving his findings, Thorndike used an experimental approach in measuring a student's academic achievement. Thorndike believed that the forming and association or connection between sensory experiences and neutral impulses result in the prime type of learning. The neutral impulses called responses are behaviorally manifested. He believed that learning often occurs by trial and error, a connecting and selecting. Law of Learning Thorndike's basic ideas rest in the law of exercises and effects. Firstly, the law of experience is divided into two parts, the law of use and the law of disuse. The law of use means that frequently recurring of the response to stimulus strengthen their connection. Meanwhile, the law of disuse means that when a response is not made of stimulus, the connection written is weakened or even forgotten. Drills are vital to acquire and sustain learning. In the very words of Thorndike, 1913, bonds between stimuli and responses are strengthened through being exercised frequently, recently, and vigorously. Learners usually learn faster when they often apply certain skills and tend to forget when such a response does not require over some time. Cara. 2012. This explains why pianists repeatedly practice their piece before their performance. By practicing, this is the law of use, they can ensure that they can perform correctly. While when they are not practicing the piece, it is a law of disuse, which is they may encounter difficulty. Thorndike later revised the law of exercise. He confessed that by merely practicing, one does not bring improvement in learning. Practicing according to Thorndike is not sufficient. Hence, the constant practice must be followed by some reward or satisfaction to the learners. In short, pupils must be motivated to learn. The law of effect emphasizes that if a response is followed by a satisfying state of affairs, the SR connection is threatened, while if a response is followed by an annoying state of affair, the SR connection is weakened. The third law of learning also has something to do with boosting of human motivation. The law of readiness states that if one is prepared to act, to do is rewarding, and not to do so is punishing. In short, before learning commences, one must be physically, emotionally, mentally, and psychologically prepared. This law is illustrated when the learner knows the answer to the particular question. Calling him her to recite is a rewarding. However, when the teacher calls a student who does not know the answer, maybe they are annoying, thus weakening the bond of stimulus and response. 
the law of readiness is also used in sequencing topic when students are ready to learn to a particular action in terms of developmental level or prior skills accusation. Then behaviors that foster this learning will be rewarding. Meanwhile, when students are not ready to learn or do not possess prerequisite skills, then attempting to learn is a punishing and even become a waste of time. Other laws of learning. Thorndike also observed that the first thing learned is that it has the strongest S and R band and is almost increasable. He calls this as the law of primacy. It implies that learning a concept or skill again is more difficult than the first time one has learned. This explains why teachers correct the students who have misconceptions in a new lessons. The application part is a lesson plan or daily lesson slug and is strategically situated before generalizing a concept so that the teachers can detect the misunderstandings of the students in a certain lessons. When the misconception is not corrected for the first time, that will lead to habit formation. In English, relearning the correct concept letter will be confusing to the students or even time-consuming. Hence, the first or prime learning experience should be as functional, as precise, and as positive as possible so that it paves the way to the more comfortable learning experience to follow. As much as possible, Teachers provide activities that come with extreme relevance to the learners. The teaching principle is primarily rooted in Thorndike law of intensity. Thorndike believed that exciting, immediate, or even dramatic learning within the real concept of the students would tremendously facilitate learning. Hence, the law of intensity implies that exposing the students in real-world application of the skills and concepts make them most likely to remember the experience. The current K-12 curriculum of the country immerses senior high school students to a short time reel. World application called on the job training or OGT. They receive a forecast on how the skills and concepts they learn in class are applied in the real workplace. In that sense, the learning experience become more intense and most likely be remembered. The concepts or skills most recently learned are less forgotten. This is the guest of the law of recency. Thus, when learners are isolated in time from learning a new concept, the more difficult it is for them to remember. For instance, in a foreign language class, French, it is easier to recall and recite than which are learned minutes ago than those which were taught on the other month. This implies that teachers should facilitate learning by providing the learners with a clear connection between the previous and the current learning experience, letting the students mention or apply the firmly learned skill or concept in the new learning experience may refresh your memory, thus the highest probability of forgetting. Thorndike also mentioned that humans tend to show an almost similar response to an entirely different stimulus. If on recurring instances, the stimulus has slight changes compared to the previously known R1. Thorndike points this is the principles of associative shifting. For example, to teach pupils to add a three-digit number, teachers let them master the adding of one-digit number first. As the solve increasing number, pupils will tend to associate the response to the previous paired S and R. The transfer of course within the context of learning have identical elements and call for similar similar responses. Thorndike called it as generalization. Thorndike of 1913. This implies that not only skills should be taught in one isolated topic, but also the other related subjects or topics should provide opportunities for the students to apply them. In the social study class, it is not enough to teach the students to read maps, but it is better if they are also taught to calculate miles from inches. Later, that skill is reinforced when they will create the maps and problem to solve. Good day to each and everyone. My name is Jessica Sweet Lamanilo Armayan, and I'm here to tackle the lesson 3.
Now, here is the lesson 3, which is the Skinner's Operant Conditioning. At the end of the lesson, you will be able to describe referencement and punishment in the context of the operant conditioning. Differentiate the characteristics and the theories of classical and operant conditioning. Analyze a research article about operant conditioning and devise a teaching strategy bank of the classroom applications of operant conditioning. One of the most popular behavioral theorists of all the time is B.F. or Burns Frederick Skinner, 1904 to 1990. He postulated the operant conditioning. Classical conditioning refers to association of simple, whereas operant conditioning actively involves the subject participation. The subject in operant conditioning has a choice to respond. In the other words, operant conditioning is a type of learning whereby learning occurs as a consequence of the learner's behavior. B.F. Skinner made a conclusion after experimenting on animals through the Skinner box, a device that modified the animal behavior. In this experiment, he put a rat in a box with a le lever, a bowl, and a closed chamber. If the lever was pushed, the chamber opened and dispensed food. Unconscious about the me mechanism, the rat accidentally pushed the lever and the food was dispensed. The rat learned that continuously pushing the lever could open the food dispenser to the bowl. Skinner termed the food in the such experiment as a reward. Positive referencement has so many classroom applications. Preschool teachers stamp giving stars in the hand of their pupils who may behave throughout the class, achieve high score, or become friendly within the academic time. To minimize the use of the positive referencement, however, teachers should make it clear to their students why they are stamping them three stars and what are the three big stars mean. In that way, the pupils will be motivated to repeat their pleasant behavior and they can eventually gain reward the stamp by building operant conditioning techniques into lesson plans. It is easily possible to teach children useful skills as well as good behaviors by using symbols like smiley faces, good work stamps, stickers, and even simple tricks when a child does something correctly. You are encouraging them to repeat such satisfying work further down the line. Meanwhile, negative referencement is taking something away from a situation that subsequently increases the occurrence of the response. In the other words, it is taking away an unpleasant consequence to cause the behavior to happen again. Some symbols that often function negative reference reinforce are loud noises, criticisms, annoying people, and low grades because actions that remove them tend to be referencing. For instance, teacher X wants her grade 3 class to master the multiplication table, so she gives the pupils a problem set on the multiplication table. After the set is solved, they should recite the multiplication table from multiples 5 to 10. If they master the multiplication table, the problem set is withdrawn, thus threatening the behavior precisely reciting the multiplication table. Schedule of Referencement According to Skinner, 1938, as mentioned by Jeller, 1977. Schedule refers to when Rentori applied, Skinner 1938, January 1977. Regarding Wichesca's sweet Armayan's topic, the Skinner's operant conditioning, let's talk about punishment. Operant conditioning also include punishment, whose main aim is to awaken the response. However, punishment does not necessarily eliminate the behavior. When the threat of punishment is removed, 
the punished response may recur. Skinner's believe that positive punishment is an addition of an unpleasant stimulus to decrease the behavior. For instance, Max, a grade 6 pupil, had been neglecting his math assignments. He completely hated washing the dishes. To decrease such behavior of neglecting his assignments, his parents assigned him to wash the dishes after the dinner. After some time, Max eventually became more diligent to complete his assignments in math. The addition of the work Max hates decreased the likelihood of the behavior to occur. Negative punishment. Meanwhile, is the removal of rewarding stimulus to decrease the behavior. For example, Jenny, a grade 3 pupil, is always noisy in a group activity. Her teacher calls her attention and warns her that she could not participate in a subsequent for fun activity if she continues to behave noisily. Joining in a fun activity is a pleasant stimulus. Withdrawing it is to believe to reduce such noisy behavior. Alternatives to punishment. Punishment is often applied in schools to address disruptions. Ma according to Maag, he enumerated some common punishment like loss of privileges, removal of the classroom, in and out of school suspensions and expulsion. Nonetheless, there are several alternatives to punishment. The primary advantage of this alternative over punishment is that it shows the student how to behave adaptively. So, there are several alternatives to punishment. First, changes the discriminative stimuli. Second, allow the unwanted behavior to continue. Third, extinguish the unwanted behavior. And lastly, the condition and incompatible behavior. Bandora Social Learning Theory Under the social learning theory, learning occurs within the social context and by observing and copying other behavior or imitation. Akers and Jensen, 2006. Albert Bandora is the proponent of this theory where modeling is the crucial component. Modeling refers to a change in one's behavior by observing models, Rosenthal and Bandora, 1978. Historically, modeling was equated with imitation but modeling is a more inclusive concept, Mosin, 1983. Social learning theory emphasizes the importance of observing modeling, and imitating the behavior, attitude, and emotional reaction of others. Social learning theory consider how both environment and cognitive factor interact to influence human learning and behavior. The Fundamental Principle of Social Learning Theory Number 1. One may learn without changing his or her behavior. This is in contrast to what other behaviors discussed earlier, for them a change in behavior is always an indication of learning. Number 2. Learning takes place by imitating a model. That model possesses characteristic intelligence, physical aura, popularity, or talent that a learner finds attractive and desirable. Admiration plays an essential role in imitating a particular behavior of the model. This explains why speech teachers recite a crucial sound first, then guide the learners until they can recite the sound correctly by themselves. Number 3. An observing person will always react to the one being imitated depending on whether the model is rewarded or punished. If the model receives rewards, the imitator copies the behavior, and if the former is punished, the latter will most likely avoid copying the behavior. Number 4. Acquiring and performing behavior are different. Bandora made a demarcation line between performing and acquiring behavior. 
One can acquire the behavior by observing someone but may opt not to perform it until the next require so. Number 5. Interaction is vital for successful social learning. Social learning may occur successfully when learners interact with their co-learners and models. Morlam 2013 Learning in isolation may dampen self-efficacy. This means that copying behavior involves the guiding of one person's behavior by another person, such as when an art instructor gives guidance and corrective feedback to an art student who is attempting to draw a picture with copying behavior. The final copied responds in reinforce and thereby strengthen. Number 6. Learning is self-regulated. Bandora noted that self-regulation occurs when individuals observe, assist, and judge their behavior against their standard, and subsequently reward and punish them. Number 7. Learning may be acquired vicariously. Vicarious learning is acquired from observing the consequences of others' behavior. For instance, when the model is given praise and reward, the observes may likely repeat the copied behavior because he or she feels the same satisfaction too. Lastly, number 8. Learning may be reinforced by the model or by others. Compliments coming from the model may strengthen the occurrence of the behavior. Similarly, when a person praised by his or her purse because of a change in behavior, he or she may show an increase in that behavior. Hello and have a nice day everyone. I am Mary Choi Orozco and I am here to discuss to you the lesson 4 which is the Neo Behaviorism. Behavior implies the performance, the achievements of an altered relationship between the organism and its environment. There are the key concepts of purposive behaviorism by Thomas. The first is learning is always purposive and goal-oriented. Thomas believes that an organism acted or responded for some adaptive purpose and that individuals do more than just responding to stimuli but act on belief, attitude, changing condition, and steve towards goals. He saw behavior as holistic, purposive, and cognitive. Example, a student studying for an examination because his purpose is to have a higher grade and to be honor student in their class. Second, cognitive maps organism will select the shortest or easiest path to achieve a goal. Example, Tolman experienced with the two groups or rats put on a maze for 17 days. It was observed that in the first 10 days, the rats develop a cognitive map. Therefore, of 11th day, they perform and look for the end point faster than the previous days. The third one is latent learning. It refers to the knowledge that only becomes clear with a person and has an incentive to display it. Example, a four-year-old boy observed his father in using the remote control when he would be left alone and had the opportunity to turn on the TV using the remote control, he could easily demonstrate the learning. Fourth is the concept of intervening variable. It is whatever is going on with the organism that brings about the behavioral response to give a stimulus situation. Example, the classic example of intervening variable is hunger. During the experience of Tolman's with the rats put in maize for 17 days, the group without food went to look the maize faster than the first group. We cannot see that they are hungry, but it was fun motivation to go out faster to look for food, to fill in their hunger stomach. And the last is the reinforce is not essential for learning. It is not essential for learning, although it provides an extensive of performance. Example, let's go back to his experience with the two groups of rats put it in a maze for 17 days. The first group were given foods as incentive for finding the way out of the maze. 
in the other group without were not given any. On the 11th day, the group without any incentive at all went out. The maize faster than the first group to find food because they were hungry. So, it only shows that reinforcement is not essential for learning because the rats are eager to go out because on their goal. And that's all the key concept of purposive behaviorism by Tolmans. First, the learning is always purposive and goal-oriented. Second, cognitive maps. Third, the Latin learning. Fourth, the concept of intervening variable. And the last one is re reinforcement is not essential for, le for learning. And that's end with our discussion. Any questions and clarification, just comment down below. This is Glidel R. Pongaran together with Hans J. Atesado, Mary Mel Fernandez, Madel Bayonla, Yunilin Arubio, Cheska Sweet Armayan, Anna Marie Ebrano, and Mary Joy Orozco.